Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a really powerful ARM-based single board computer that just hit the market from Friendly Elect, known as the R6S. Now, uh, we love the Raspberry Pi. Obviously, it's a great little single board computer, awesome community behind it, but uh, right now it's a bit hard to get your hands on at retail price. It's also pretty far along in its life cycle, and I know a lot of my viewers have kind of been looking for an alternative with a little more power. Now, uh, I say a little more power, but uh, when it comes to this new board here, it's close to four times more powerful than the Raspberry Pi 4, and as of making this video, it's actually the cheapest board that I found with this CPU. This is actually using the RK3588, coming in at $119. So it is a little more expensive than the Raspberry Pi 8 gigabyte model, but not by much at all. Now there are a couple features here missing that are on the Raspberry Pi 4, like built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, but they do make it up with built-in eMMC storage and two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports. These are running over a PCIe lane, and yeah, I mean, this thing is just as small as the Raspberry Pi 4, but putting out a lot more power. Friendly Elect has been making single board computers for a long time now. I've done a bunch of reviews on their boards, mainly with the RK3399, you know, given the performance that that thing put out when it was released. But now we've got this new chip, the RK3588. And yeah, I mean, if you're into emulation, this will do GameCube and even PS2 and Android. Over here on this side, we've got a micro SD card slot. We can actually run our operating system from this, or we can use it to install to the internal eMMC. These come standard with 32 gigabytes of internal storage. Over here on this side, we've got a USB Type-C port. Now, unfortunately, this only does power. No data or video will be transferred over this, but it supports PD charging or PD power, 9 volts, 12 volts, 15, or 20. We've also got a full-size HDMI 2.1 port, and this will do up to 8K60 out with the correct software. And of course, you can see we've got three Ethernet ports over here. We've got one standard gigabit Ethernet port, and we've also got two 2.5 gigabit ports that are running over a PCIe bus. One downside to this board is the lack of more USB ports. We get one USB 2.0 port and one USB 3.0 port, and this really has to do with them using that PCI for the 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. We can use an adapter here to add more USB ports, but uh, yeah, it would be nice to see four on this unit. This is a passively cooled single board computer, so we don't have any moving parts here, and I just kind of wanted to show you the case. This is full aluminum, and I mean, we've got a really thick chunk here, and it does keep this RK3588 quite cool. And the layout is actually pretty nice. Uh, so this does come with 8 gigabytes of LPDDR4 RAM, and it's running in dual channel, which is a big plus. I've seen some of these boards with single channel RAM, and it does hurt the GPU performance. There is a connector for a real-time clock battery if you wanted to add that. And of course, I mean, you could always come up with a modified cooling system for this if you didn't want to use the case. But I mean, the layout is really nice here. We've got access to that micro SD card slot. And on the bottom here, we've got our eMMC storage chip. So yeah, the specs are looking great here for the price when it comes to these ARM-based single board computers. So uh, for that CPU, we've got the Rock Chip RK3588. It's an eight core ARM SOC. We've got four A76 cores running it up to 2.4 gigahertz and four A55 cores running it up to 1.8 gigahertz. But what makes this chip really special is the GPU because we've got the Mali G610 MP4. This does support OpenGL and Vulkan. And like I mentioned, I mean, in Android, we can run GameCube and PS2 games with this, and even native Android games. Something like Genshin Impact runs on this at low settings really well. These come with eight gigabytes of LPDDR4X RAM running at 2,133 megahertz. We've also got 32 gigabytes of internal eMMC storage, but remember, you can always use a micro SD card if you want to. 1 gigabit Ethernet port, 2 PCIe 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports, and when it comes to operating systems, right now they've actually got a bunch over on their website, but more are to come. We've got Ubuntu, Debian, and Android. Now the Android version that we have here is Android TV, and that's exactly what we're going to be taking a look at in this video. Mainly because it came pre-installed on the eMMC storage, and I was really interested in checking out Android TV on this chip. So far, we've only really been able to look at the tablet version of Android, so let's go ahead and see how this performs. I mean, this actually might make a good replacement for an NVIDIA Shield TV. And if the interest is there, yes, we can take a look at Linux. We could do Ubuntu or Debian. Just let me know in the comments below. I don't mind making another video, but I know for sure that these chips perform really well with Linux.
plugged into a 4K display. And since we don't have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth on this unit, I've got Ethernet plugged in. I've also got a USB hub plugged in. Now this is just a massive one that I have laying around, but uh, I don't need to power it or anything like that. It'll just add a few more. It's definitely overkill given how much I.O. I have on this hub here, but you don't need anything like this. I mean, you could get a cheap one from Amazon, just add two more or four more USB ports with ease. Another thing I've added here to that port was just a Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth dongle. So I picked this up on Amazon and it's actually great. This does work with this version of Android. Sometimes it's hit or miss, but I got lucky with this. So we've got Bluetooth and Wi-Fi from this single dongle. So far, this thing has been really snappy, and this is actually Android TV 12. It's not Google Chromecast with Google TV or whatever they're calling it nowadays. This is true Android TV, basically the same thing you'd find on the Nvidia Shield. And another great thing about this operating system is we've got Google Play pre-installed. You know, when it comes to these single board computers or even Android boxes in general, sometimes we don't get Google Play. But keep in mind, this is the Android TV version, so we can't access a lot of the apps that we'd like to run on kind of a tablet or a phone. But you can sideload them. So yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff that we're going to be testing out in this video. I want to go through some 4K video playback. We're going to test out some native Android gaming and emulation. But uh, first up, let's head over to the settings. First on the list here is display. We've got full control over HDMI. I've got this set up for 4K60 on this monitor here. We've also got the option to enable HDR10, and this monitor just happens to support it, so I can turn that on. We've also got some advanced display settings, so we can actually change the brightness, contrast, and things like that. There's a few presets, but I think one of the coolest things that I saw with this version of Android TV is the AI upscaling. This RK3588 does have a built-in MPU, and you know, if you're familiar with the NVIDIA Shield, you know that the Shield also has this. But there's actually a couple extra settings in here that the Shield doesn't have, like UI AI upscaling. So it'll definitely clean that picture up. And basically, with this AI upscaling, we can make 480p video look like 720p. But yeah, I thought this was really cool to see on a single board computer. And I want to do some more experimenting with it because this could be an awesome feature. Uh, one other kind of proprietary thing that we have here was the advanced settings. We actually have kind of a performance overlay. But unfortunately, no FPS is being displayed, and the CPU clock they're showing here is actually only registering the A55 cores. I've already contacted the developer. Hopefully, we can get an FPS counter and a little more information on screen. That way, we know exactly what's going on. Okay, so the first test I wanted to run here was some 4K video playback, and I've actually seen this on a lot of Android TVs. Uh, we'll head right here, 4K HDR 60 FPS video. If I check out the settings, if I can get over there, you'll see that we are at 4K. I've got stats for nerds on, but unfortunately the YouTube app is really only displaying this at 1080p. And like I said, I've seen this a lot, so hopefully this can be fixed. Now the video itself is being rendered at 4K, it's just really our viewpoint through the app is at 1080. But I mean, the RK3588 can power through 4K video no problem at all. I mean, in fact, this actually does 8K60. So yeah, I mean, we've got more than enough power here for 4K. But one thing to note here is our widevine level is level 3. So through Netflix, HBO Go, Hulu, we're not going to be able to get 4K content, at least right now as making this video. But this is the initial release of Android TV. So maybe down the road, this can get Widevine certified, but you know, I wouldn't hold my breath on that. So native playback, Plex, you could definitely do 4K all day. Next thing I wanted to do was take a look at a few benchmarks that I ran, and here's Geekbench 5. I've never been impressed with the Geekbench score out of these chips. Single core, 541, multi, 2325. I mean, it's not horrible for a little single board computer like this, but I expected to see more out of this chip. Now, where this thing really shines is GPU performance. Here's a 3D Mark Wildlife. We got a total score of 4,463. And the final one I ran here was an 22, and we're close to 500,000. From all of my tests so far, I mean, this is on par with something like the Snapdragon 845 or even the 855 in some devices. And I know those are older chipsets for phones, but, you know, taking a look at the single board computer market, this thing is putting down the power. Next thing we're going to do is test out some native Android gaming performance. And since we've only got the Android TV version of Google Play, I did have to go through and sideload some of these, like Call of Duty Mobile and Genshin Impact. 
Now Genshin Impact will run on this chip at low settings really well, but for some odd reason I kept having the download fail on me. I mean as soon as you start the game up you have to download the full game which is about 17 gigs and I just couldn't get it to finish on this version of Android TV. But I did come up with three very different games to test here, and first up we've got Dead Cells. Not a super hard game to run, but it's really fun, especially on Android TV. And keep in mind, we do have Google Play services built in, so if you own an app and it needs to be activated through Google Play, if you sideload it, then it'll find your profile and you can actually run it here. Next up, we've got Asphalt 9. This is natively available from the Android TV version of Google Play. So uh, yeah, I mean, you can get right into it. Controller works right off and it runs amazingly. And to tell you the truth, it is a fun game to play. I've actually been playing this for about two years and I've never spent a penny on this game. And the final one here is Call of Duty Mobile. This is one I had to sideload, but this does natively support controllers as long as it's a PS4 or an Xbox controller. And it runs great on the Arcade 3588. And by the way, you know, just to sideload these, you could download the APK if you want to, or you could install a third-party app market like Aptoid or APK Pure. It's really up to you. Overall, when it comes to native Android gaming, you're going to have a really good time with this single board computer, but now it's time to move over to some emulation. And uh, with some of these emulators, I did have to sideload them. And sometimes when you sideload apps, you just can't see them on the main screen of Android TV. So I use this sideload launcher, that way we can take a look at everything we have here. We're going to go with some Dreamcast, some PSP, some GameCube, and some PS2. And yeah, when it comes to Dreamcast on a system like this, you're really not going to have any issues. As long as the game is compatible with the emulator, be it using ReDream or Flycast, it's going to run at full speed. And if you're using Flycast, you can also do Naomi and Atomus Wave really well. PSP, using the standalone version of PPSSPP, I just threw one at it real quick to show you. We've got Chains of Olympus at 3x Vulcan backend, and it runs great on this device. And for the easier to emulate PSP games, we can even go up to 5x resolution. But uh, one thing I ran into here, which was the first time I ever saw it, was I glitched the game out. I've got Kratos stuck here, really odd, but as soon as I reloaded my save state, it was fine. So like I mentioned, this chip can handle GameCube and Wii games, but you're not going to be able to run the really hard to emulate stuff. Automodalista is okay, we do get some dips into the low 50s, but something like F-Zero, it runs at about 45 FPS on those harder to emulate tracks. But there's still a ton of easier to emulate GameCube games that run at full speed. Here's Time Splitters 2, 1x resolution, Vulcan backend, you could also go with Mario Sunshine if you want to. And there are Wii games that run at full speed. Here's Sonic Colors. This is one of those games that natively ran at 30 FPS. We could hack it to run at 60 in the Dolphin emulator, but I just left it here. Got a few hiccups every once in a while, but not bad at all for a single board computer. But I gotta say, one of the most impressive things that the RK3588 can do is PS2 using EtherSX2. Now we've also got this available in Linux, so if I do end up doing a test, we'll test some more games out. But on Android, we get really great performance with a lot of stuff. One of my favorite games, Gran Turismo 4, can run at 3x on this. But here's Kingdom Hearts 2 at 2x resolution, Vulcan backend, and it even runs God of War 2 quite well. So we're still using that Vulcan backend, and under 1x resolution is probably the way to go just to alleviate any kind of low frame rates with this. But I wanted to see how far we could take it, and basically 1.25 before we started seeing major dips. So at this price point, it's really hard to beat this kind of performance when it comes to these ARM-based single board computers. At 119, I really do think this is a good deal, and to some people this might be overpriced, and I completely understand that, but you gotta keep in mind that the Raspberry Pi 4 8GB model, when it was released, was going for $75, but if you do a search right now, you're gonna see it anywhere from, you know, $100 up to $150 on eBay and Amazon, because you can't find them and people are kind of scalping them right now. And given that this doesn't cost much more than the retail price of that 8GB Pi 4, but it's offering 3-4 to four times the performance, I think it's a really awesome little single board computer. 
If you're interested in learning more, maybe picking one up, I'll leave a couple links in the description, but that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you want to see Linux running on the R6S, just let me know in the comments below. And if the answer is yes, let me know which variant. We've got Debian and Ubuntu, and that's really for the desktop variants. Unfortunately, at the time of making this video, we don't have any Arch, but seeing Manjaro running on this would be really cool. If you have any questions, let us know in the comments below. And like always, thanks for watching.